Good morning, uh, everyone. I'm Pranjal Sharma. Welcome to this uh, exciting session on economic integration of South Asia. Um, before I say anything, let me quickly introduce uh, our panelist, uh, Minister Mustafa Kamal, Minister of Planning from Bangladesh, Minister Malik Samara Vikrama, Minister of Development and Strategies and International Trade from Sri Lanka, Richard Reiki, Chief Executive Ag Officer and Managing Partner of KPMG, Siraj Azmat Chaudhary, Chairman of Kargil India, and Dr. Samir Saran, Vice President at the Observer Research Foundation. This is a very interesting conversation, and I'm sure you realize, realize it's happening at a very a crucial moment for, for South Asia as well. South Asia has been traditionally fragmented in every way that you look at it, uh, politically, security-wise, economically. And now I think there is a realization across the region that uh, it should not remain like this. We have seen uh, far uh, more disparate regions come together. East Africa has a customs union. Southeast Asia is a great example for us. So what can be done to ensure that South Asia is and should become a, a far more cohesive market uh, where the trade and investment links can, can uh, be enhanced. I'm going to request uh, all the panelists to share their views and of course their experiences and ideas on what, what should happen and what has happened so far. Let me begin by uh, requesting Minister uh, Samar Vikrama to give uh, his perspective. Uh, Sri Lanka in many ways is, is, uh, has shown the way for South Asia in terms of uh, economic growth. Um, you, you have, despite the past, a very stable economy. Uh, Minister, what is your view on how can Sri Lanka and the other countries come closer? Thank you. <clears throat> Morning, everybody. First of all, I think we must uh, understand that the historical circumstances under which South Asian countries were born uh, and the resulting identities they carry don't make cooperation easy. Uh, most of the countries are still preoccupied with the internal consolidation to invest political capital in uh, regional cooperation or regional integration. Uh, there's also a lack of state capacity that has been a factor. And uh, at the same time, there are a series of groups with vested interests that continue to benefit from political conflict uh, political economy of conflict and the status quo. So that is the background that uh, our countries were born and we have to really seriously think of how we can go forward. Having said that, there are many opportunities I can see. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there have been at least at the official level and political level, at the leadership level, uh, greater readiness to accept the need for regional cooperation. You know, yesterday, our Prime Minister and the Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi had very cordial and extensive uh, discussions on how we can work together. So there are also major projects underway, particularly in northeast uh, of the subcontinent, where we see connected between Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, India, uh, it is significantly enhanced. In addition, uh, from Sri Lanka's point of view, we have a free trade agreement with India and now we are in the process of uh, deepening that agreement and we are looking at a more comprehensive economic and techno technological uh, cooperation agreement which we hope to have in place in the first quarter of next year. Uh, at the same time, we are invigorating the free trade agreement we have with Pakistan. So from our point of view, we are looking at a market of about 1.5 billion people. So I think this is, I believe, is the way to go forward. Right. Um, I'll come back to you more on, on how Sri Lanka and what is its footprint across South Asia and how do you see the next step. But uh, Minister Kamal from Bangladesh, uh, you have, again, a very special place in global trade uh, with very clear focus on industries like textile. Where is Bangladesh and its integration uh, with the other countries in the region? Okay, uh, good morning to everybody. This is, uh, as you are aware, Bangladesh is a country, if you don't visit and don't know intensely, in that case, you will not be believing. So that is the reason. 
World Bank President he himself is coming on the 14th to know himself, the incredible growth Bangladesh is having. I'll give you a few points. You see, just 10 years back in the year 2005, we had a poverty level to the tune of 43%. In 10 years' time, by the end of 2015, it has come down to the level of 11.1%. So that is amazing. It is simply amazing. And this, and the country, it is endowed with a lot of gifts and endowments, as you are aware. 76 percent of our 160 million people are of the working age population, and uh, this demographic demographic dividend we shall be achieving until 2045. Now, under the leadership of our honourable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. She is a visionary leader. She works by numbers, objective-based, and that is the reason during the last seven years we have been, we have been consistently performing over 6% of the GDP growth. So the average GDP growth is 6.3% during the last seven years, eight years time. Last year we have achieved 7.1%. This year we have a target to achieve 7.25%. As far our projection, by the year 2020, we shall be achieving 8%, and this 8% will continue to achieve until 2030. You might be knowing Price Waterhouse and Coopers and uh, Goldman Sachs, everybody has projected that Bangladesh is one of the countries. They will be never growing less than 6% until 2050. Unbelievable. So, based on that projection, <coughs> by the year 2040, they have indicated Bangladesh will be 23rd largest economy in the world. But as a planning minister, I shall be sincerely pursuing my endeavor so that now, you know, when G20, G20 meeting is there, in that case, Bangladesh is also being invited from the sidelines. But my endeavor will be, we want to be on the mainframe by the year 2040. This is our Honorable Prime Minister also has projected like that. We should be, we must be joining the big countries, elite countries like India. India, India right at the moment is the seventh largest economy in the world, as you are aware. <coughs> but one thing I must, I should tell here, the uh, all our, I'm grateful to all of you because you are here for one cause, the cause is to serve humanity. And I also, as a minister, I work in Bangladesh for the cause of humanity to make improvements in every areas of economic so that people can stand on their own feet can I can have everybody on the mainstream economy. Now you see, last 500 years, it was the time for the West. Now next 500 years will be the time for the East. But you know- There is no denying to this fact. I'm, I'm, that's a great just, point. I, I just, yeah. just one minute, I'm, I'll take one more minute. Hmm. Because what I am saying, it is, a, it is from history. <coughs> exactly in the year 001, 2000, 2016 years back, India was number one country in the world, and China was number two country. No, China was the second number two country in the world. China at that time was having one one third of the population and one third of the world economy, and China was having one fourth of the population and one fourth of the economy. Even <laughs> you might be knowing when East India Company was formed in to the, in 1601, exactly on that day, India was occupying. 22% of the world economy. So what you had, we are trying to go back to that, you know, because there is, a, right. there, is a, there is a transformation everywhere. So my idea is this, if India grows, if China grows, they can't grow themselves alone. They'll have to take Sri Lanka and Bangladesh also along with them. Absolutely. So this is, my, this is my objective of talking so much about India, because you have not offered me a cup of coffee. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but even then I have said, <laughs> I'm, I'm saying, for my sake, again I'm saying, we'll have to 
integrate ourselves. We'll have to, we'll have to move forward together and we'll have to move as fast as possible. I think I agree with you because you said, uh, you know, we have another 500 years. I don't think we have the patience for that uh, anymore uh, because <laughs> we are one of the most populous regions in the world. Already uh, started, I'm saying, you know, because <laughs> you, you should not even, you know, by the year 2030, right. not by the year, no, I see, already China is number one in terms of purchasing sure. popularity. So by the year 2040, China will be number one country in terms of purchasing popularity as well as in terms of nominal, uh, nominal value basis. And at that time, India will be number two and America will be number three. And if anybody is from America, don't, they should not be upset. You know, at one time, even Argentina was number one country. So only uh, exactly in the year 1892, America became number one. So before that, others were number one. So we want to get back to, get back to our own position old position by pursuing our and by exploiting our resources. That's a great point. So let me bring in Siraj here. Siraj, as, as an investor, you have to put the money on the policies that are announced. Uh, as a global corporation, also with the South Asia put, footprint, um, tell us, how, how, do, uh, how do you see the region? Is there, is there a common market for you already? Um, do you see that as an aspiration which is too far to achieve or is it closer than we realize? Thanks, Pranjal. I think uh, to begin with, uh, I would say that, you know, we, the numbers are all there to say that there is an opportunity. I mean, there's broad consensus that uh, this is a large uh, population spread across this region, uh, you know, one of the fastest or the fastest growing GDP, uh, the demographics are right. Uh, so, in theory, everything looks good. I mean, any corporation would look at that population, would look at that, uh, uh, you know, demand, uh, that GDP rate, uh, and, you know, the growth rates that are happening. But uh, there are challenges. So, I mean, they haven't, uh, con the opportunities haven't yet been converted into real business uh, cases because uh, I think, uh, you know, if I step back a bit and look at how th these geographies are scattered today, uh, they are actually all trying to come up on their own. So, so India obviously is in the forefront, uh, probably because we started earlier and having the advantage of the large uh, population, land mass, education, whatever you call it. And, uh, and then leveraging the presence in India to spread to the neighboring countries is, I think, the approach a lot of corporations would be taking. We've been looking at the same thing, uh, particularly being in the food and agriculture space, uh, that provides us an opportunity, but to say that uh, have, I mean, are things great? The answer is no. Uh, are things better than they were in the past? Uh, yes, certainly. I mean, we are uh, finding opportunities to get across the border to supply food, to you know, get into processing, uh, and so there is that change happening. So, in my view, I think we have a uh, some distance to cover. So, uh, what, the what would, what would you like to be changed, Siraj? I think it's a lot about uh, the internal uh, processes. And to be fair, I think each of these countries, I mean, uh, first have to get their own house in order. I mean, mm -hmm. to say that it's, uh, you know, ease of doing business in India isn't great for companies in India as yet, right? So to suddenly expect it to be great for people coming from outside. So India has been 29 markets, so finally we'll be one market. Exactly. So, so I think uh, everyone has to, I mean, the phrase I was uh, sharing with you before this thing was that, you know, you can be nice to your neighbors if you're happy in your own, own house first. And <laughs> I think that's the stage yeah. uh, we are in. I have, the good news is that we're all getting happier in our own house. And therefore, there has to be optimism that going forward, there'll be more and better collaboration uh, with the neighbors. I think uh, what we've started doing, uh, we, have, we have now, uh, we are more comfortable being counterparties to each other. Uh, I think that's the first step towards becoming partners to each other. I think that happiness must spread, as you're saying, and uh, hopefully the happiness spreads with more money being, you know, uh, traded and more uh, uh, wealth being shared but, across uh, the region. I mean, I, I can actually add uh, uh, sort of an example, which is not business, but uh, that has kind of worked uh, well for the region. And, uh, and that's totally different from what we're talking about here. That's actually cricket. Uh, and, I was uh, wondering when this word would come <laughs> up. And, and, and if you see the evolution of cricket, I mean, we were individually the whipping boys at different stages of uh, the evolution of world cricket. And uh, over the years, as one country and the other country gained uh, experience and became better, our ability to support each other in the ICC, our uh, teams doing better. And with the result, and with India being the center, 
the region has been able to hold so many World Cups together. Individually, a Bangladesh or a Sri Lanka or a Pakistan would not have been able to hold a World Cup. But together, we've been able to bring that change. And I think with that, the economy and you know the IPL now where everyone plays is part of the same team. So that's really a symbolic indicator of how things can move as each uh, country sort of strengthens its own game. True, that's a, that's a good example and symbol of cultural affinity which needs to be built on. Richard, uh, you, you advise global corporations who are investing in India and the region and you're also advising uh, regional global uh, companies. Are people ready to look at South Asia as a region or are investors still looking at each country as a separate market and then therefore having to you know, navigate across each country rather than looking at one region? So uh, like uh, Siraj said, I think before I answer that question, I think it's important to understand that this region, South Asia, is possibly the fastest growing region in the world today. In terms of GDP growth percentage, I think it will be about 7.3 if you take the whole region uh, together and with uh, the minister just said that they've got projections to go up to 8%. So all that will add and further enhance the growth in the region. So uh, the second one which I would say is that uh, this total region has uh, uh, economic value of about $2.5 trillion. Okay? And once we are a region of $2.5 trillion, it becomes a big uh, you know, you go for bargaining on any on any trade agreement, on every such thing, it becomes very useful. And if we take Bangladesh, uh, which is there as the bridge to connect uh, South Asia with Southeast Asia and become that link, I think you are creating a completely very different uh, trade barrier. So you've got a 2.5 trillion economy, South Asia trading with another 2.5 trillion economy, which is Southeast Asia, the ASEAN region. And imagine what trade can be done because once trade comes together it builds prosperity prosperity will build peace and bring harmony in the region and each of the people will each of the countries will actually uh, develop out there i think even we go down further and look at which areas would look at it you take sri lanka sri lanka has the maximum accountants per capita uh, 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 um, accountants per capita anywhere in the world i think it is the, it's the number one okay if you take India's accounting base, you take Bangladesh accounting, we can become the accounting powerhouse and we can build the KPOs, uh, the BPOs, the back office in this region and it can become a very ra large thing to the world. So this is one area which one can uh, definitely look at as a, as a big advantage that we could look at. And the other one could be when we look at the, um, the, the, the trading on the, on the past side, if you look at between, you know, Bhutan, Nepal has got those hydel kind of how do you get it? Bangladesh has got gas. How do we actually get that gas transported? So the, the point is... And there would be more economic efficiencies. In more such economic efficiencies, better price to the consumers. Today, if you see, because we are a disjointed economies and with India now bringing GST in and we're becoming one market, I think India is now ready to take the next leap. And India can play that uh, one role of saying, okay, how do you actually unify this market and take it to the next level. So I think there is a, a good sense, in my view, of looking at South Asia as one market. When you talk of global companies, when they look at, they still don't look at it as South Asia, honestly. They will still, even when they look at India, they look at which state they want to come in. So they don't look at India as India, they look at which state they come in, they put their industry. But when they come into India, then they say, okay, why are we missing these markets? Then they move into Bangladesh and Sri Lanka as markets which are there. And both these markets, for example, we do a lot of work in Bangladesh out of India. So we have seen that market a little more closely. Fortunately, I've traveled to both Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and understand those markets. And we have, we have been doing a lot of advisory work for clients out there. So textiles is another thing which can actually bind it. And if you look at textiles, textiles is possibly you, the biggest job Richard, creator. With your experience, do you see companies in these countries working closer with each other now? Yeah, you will find. I mean, there are a few examples of people from you know, both sides where Bangladesh companies have come into India, Sri Lankan companies have come into India, Indian companies have gone into these regions and they are trying to collaborate and work together uh, because they find that... Uh, see, because you can't ignore this market. You see, the Indian market today has encouraged Chinese goods to come in. So why don't we let the South Asian goods come into this country? I mean, simple. I'm just saying, look at that as a area of which one could look at. That's a great point. Samir, uh, it looks like from all the speakers uh, that a lot of individual and independent efforts are happening. We've had structures like uh, SARC and BIMSTEC and some others. But it seems that those, those uh, regional frameworks 
uh, have not perhaps been as efficient. It's still a bunch of individual efforts. So I ask you the simplest question. Is SARC dead, and should we move to a new way of doing business with each other? Is SARC dead? SARC in some avatar will continue to live. Um, and I think um, the efforts to create uh, smaller sub-regionals is, in a sense, uh, the, first, the beginning of the revitalization of SARC. I believe if we can get five or six countries working together, that might attract even the others to join in. So I think uh, to, to keep SARC alive, we need to get uh, the BIMSTEC working, we need to get the Bay of, Bay of Bengal community vibrant, we need to get the BBIN grouping, uh, uh, you know, make it feasible, make it efficient. But I think, uh, let me um, make three points. Uh, and let me also confess that I was drafted last minute and I was told <laughs> that you need to be here because you don't know anything on trade. So we need someone who, who looks from outside. So let me just make three or four quick points. The first is I don't think regional integration is anymore an option for uh, India and its neighbors. I think it is a compulsion. And let me tell you why. I think the, the fundamental assumptions of the past century, where we all believed that the open, free, liberal trading order, the global trading order, would allow us to grow and benefit from international markets consumptions, is over. Those who created the international trading system are undermining it. The WTO framework is waning and is a pale shadow of what it, it is meant to be, which clearly means that new arrangements are being crafted even as we speak. And in that sense, countries who require 20 years of unhindered growth will have to find new arrangements for themselves. Even as the Americans stitch together various treaties and our other neighbors create their own arrangements, one belt, one road, and others, um, smaller countries will also have to find um, markets will also have to find new trading deals. So I think it's a compulsion today. It is no longer a luxury. Second, I think the assumptions, some of the other assumptions are also dying. So manufacturing-led growth, for example. That assumption, I think China was the last country which moved from low income to mid income or low mid income uh, using this particular assumption. It's not going to be valid for many of us who are growing now, which means we will have to first invest in niche manufacturing, Two, we will have to invest in services and, and the knowledge industry that uh, my fellow panelist was talking about. And three, we will have to invest in regional value chains. Yeah. We cannot compete unless we can understand the power of creating value across a region. And let me give you a simple point. Most of our countries have industrial policies. All of our countries on this particular panel have industrial policies that are primarily uh, drafted to drive exports up not to invest in regional value. All of our, uh, all that we are wanting, all that our countries demand is that somehow we produce large volumes and export it to our neighbors and export it to other markets. We are still not st thinking strategically to that how can a steel industry have components across the, the Bay, Bay of Bengal community? How can a digital uh, uh, company see value across uh, uh, the waters of, 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 of Bay of Bengal? And I think that's one point we have to start uh, Right. Uh, if, and let me give you the last point. I think India has, has, uh, ha, is to blame for this region. Not, I mean, I'm, I'm being very clear. I think we have not den done enough as the largest uh, market in this region to promote regional connectivity. And I think there are two reasons for this. One was our obsession or fascination of being a continental actor. We like the land more than water, which meant that we were always <coughs> looking to our west. Uh, that was one reason. The second, of course, was the fascination with the fossil fuel economy. That because oil resided in the Gulf and in, the, in West Asia, we were always looking for linkages to that part of the world. We ignored our ease for the longest time. And we were, un we were afraid to get getting our feet wet. I think that is changing. Uh, so uh, I, as India sees itself emerge as a maritime actor, I can sense the importance of the Bay of Bengal um, community uh, uh, thriving. And uh, finally, in, in the short term, Physical linkages may still be important, but believe you me, in the long term, and when I say long term, I mean 15 years time, and not that long, digital connections will be all that matter. Geography will be irrelevant. So if we can create digital, um, a digital economy, a digital Bay of Bengal, a digital BIMSTEC, a digital South Asia, we will not have to worry about cross-border trade and transit points and checkpoints and surgical strikes. I think we can get into the business of doing business. That's, a, that's, a, that's important to understand, but you, you, uh, the question I raised to you, I'm going to raise to both the ministers uh, as well. Uh, Minister uh, Samara Vikrama, SARC has not delivered, and we are looking at something like a SARC minus Pakistan, at least on the trade and economy front, because 
you can't be held up. You have to move on. So, and the regions, as as uh, Samir said, there is a compulsion for the countries to work together. What are the structures do you see that can help bring the countries and the economies closer and be more integrated? Do we have to look at a new framework, or do we have to reform the existing frameworks? Yes. <clears throat> now, actually, I'm for total economic uh, integration in the region in South Asia. But the fact is that and it's, it's natural for neighboring countries to trade more with each other. But if you look at South Asia, uh, trade is just uh, interregional inter trade accounts for less than 5% of total trade. And interregional FDI is a mere 4%. And that too, most of the inflows have been from India. So this shows that we are nowhere near where we want to be. And uh, of course, there are many obstacles which have been there, high cost of trading within the region, absence of regional value chains, complicated and non-transparent. But so what will get everybody to sit together under yeah, one so roof to get this? First of all, I think it is extremely important to have for India and uh, Pakistan, the, the two largest economies in the region, to find a way of working together. That is. On at least so, are you saying that unless India and Pakistan economic uh, trade picks up, the rest of the countries cannot work with each well, other? I'm not saying that. No, individually we have all these countries, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, sure. uh, Pakistan, India, we have shown reasonable growth. But if you are looking at, if you are looking at uh, regional economic cooperation, right. which can really give boost all our economies, then India and Pakistan have to be together. Have to be together. I work together. We must find a way of working together. I think Samir. You know, I, very quickly. I don't think any country needs to have the veto over integration. So I don't think if we begin with this notion that everyone has to be on board and then we will create a framework, uh, it's going to work. I think we can clearly begin on a sub-regional level. We can talk about a, a common trading platform amongst four or five or six countries, and I'm sure that power of that platform will attract the others in. So I don't think we should allow either India or Pakistan to have veto over regional integration. Minister Kamal, would you, would you agree with what Samir is saying? You see, uh, the forum today, it is inter economic integration. Economic integration in, in the South Asia. Southeast Asian countries. Now, I think it is a premature idea to exclude somebody, you see. First of all, I think with the passage of time, everybody will understand. Even Pakistan cannot, be, cannot remain isolated, or Bangladesh can no, can't remain isolated, or India also can't remain isolated. So, economy, from an economic perspective, I think we should have a still scope to revisit the whole issue. But do you so, think, sir, we need a new framework for I don't think any, I think I think framework we have. Right. The framework we have, it is not it it, it is not workable. It is it has become defunct. What can right? be done to make Since it work? Since inception, it has become defunct. So what do we do to make it work? That what uh, His Excellency from Sri Lanka he has suggested. You say first of all, you have to sit together. See, you have to, the smaller groups. Say, let Pakistan and Afghanistan sit together. They find out some communities and then. Let Maldives be included. Mm -hmm. Let Sri Lanka be included. Let Pakistan be included. I mean, uh, I mean, with everybody, slowly, gradually, if you try to extend and then uh, integrate them, in their case, I think it will work. You can just uh, give, don't give it up. I think we should still have a chance to work together. And uh, if we, if at the end of the end of the day is not working, in that case, you can have a decision. But. Uh, be, you have been mistake, you have other option, options as so well. So those options should be Those, are, those options also should be strengthened side by side. You see, one thing is very, very clear. Our, this community is very fragmented mm -hmm. because yes. still we are not working in close harmony with each other. Still, either disrespect or uh, the methodology we have not fixed up, how we should, mix, how we can maximize our resources Right. How can maximize our benefits? You see, in the northeastern part of India, there is a possibility of 80,000 megawatt of electricity could be produced from hydro. Right. Same quantum could be produced from so Nepal. I think that's Even a positive. Even 23,000 from Bhutan. Correct. Have we ever tried? 
Have we ever even exploited? Right. So such a huge resources at our disposal, and it is green energy, which is the solution. You know, by the year 2030, you'll have to go for green energy. Right. So I think these this sort of this sort of resources should be exploited, and then I think slowly, gradually, things will definitely come into proper shape. Anybody, China alone, how they can become rich? How they can become number one without? I mean, my leaving the uh, neighbors isolated, not at all. True. So even China, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, I mean, our this group, as Mr. Chaudhary has said, he has said this. Uh, I think seeing me right. in, the, in, the, in the in the here, you know, but he was know, talking let about me, cricket. Let me, let me he was, bring in he was he was talking about cricket, you know. Correct. So cricket is not today's subject, but he was talking cricket because after seeing me. Right. You know that I was, <coughs> you know that I was the president of ICC, <laughs> yes. and uh, one thing is very clear. I, I should tell you, in our country, if you ask people, there are many religions. There are uh, Buddhism. There are Muslims. There are uh, Christianities. There are uh, Hindus. Okay, fine. So they are subdivided and fragmented. But there is only one religion that is about cricket. <laughs> so cricket is the religion there. So through, cr through cricket also, I think we can develop our friendship, <coughs> de develop our bondage, and that's the way also we can touch each other's mind and we can touch each other's hearts and we can win over everything. So I am True. A, I'm a believer, I'm always a believer that uh, it is possible, you know, because uh, everybody, became, everybody had their success. And if we go back to those histories in that case, we'll have to agree that we have also possibilities of sure. going, so moving you, forward. You're right, and I think Siraj is right, that cricket Only is one thing, one point I will take from, I will, I will explain you. Sure. Now I'm, no, I'm talking here as a minister, but I'm from business background. You know, I'm a chartered accountant, you know, from KPMG. I also work with KPMG. <laughs> now, uh, about Bangladesh, I'm telling you, at one point of time, I was employing over 6,000 people. I never sustain losses. In Bangladesh, if you if you invest money there, it is open. In any sector you can you can you can invest other than other than defense. Only one sector is earmarked, kept outside the purview. That is defense. In any sector, or all sectors are open to everybody. You can invest even 100 percent. That is the only one. That is the country. If you invest money in a factory, in that case, automatically you become the owner of the land itself, freehold land. It's not a it is not a leasehold land. Things like that. And in Bangladesh, if you want to, if you invest money, if you, if you wish to incur losses, you'll have to make plan. If you want to make profit, you never have to make any plan. Because safety net is so big, you can take it from me. Because I had over 6,000 people, and I started my, uh, I, I started my, uh, initially I started from business, you know, so I know what it offers. Great. So let me bring in Siraj here. You talked about cricket and both of you are experts. Uh, cricket has made a lot of money for itself, but it has to make money for other uh, uh, sectors as well. It's not making I money. It is uh, <laughs> no, but, integrating but, people, <laughs> touching, each other's, <laughs> touching each other's minds and hearts sure. you know, and winning people, you know, engaging Absolutely. them, engaging but, you them know, I think the main cause. Using that to, to bring uh, better business ties, I think that is still missing. But Siraj, the concrete steps like the uh, Bhutan, uh, Bangladesh, uh, India, Nepal road uh, project is something which is something on the ground. It's, it's uh, where the first of the trucks have moved and crossed borders and brought uh, in the test pilot stage. How important is that for the region, especially for a company like yours? See, uh, you know, going back to the point that has been discussed here, saying that, okay, there are a lot of differences within the countries, I mean, despite the similarities. So one approach uh, could be to say that, okay, because we are neighbors, we ought to be together, right? So that's a uh, sort of broad statement saying that that's the logic. But uh, there are realities which don't let that happen. So then we have to go into finding areas of interdependencies. Mm -hmm. and, and you create, you identify those interdependencies and create your circles around that. And, and gradually grow those circles. And I think 
this uh, the BBIN or the CESEC, uh, CESEC, which is more a project-driven uh, approach, those are beginnings which can actually create, uh, the, I would call them small circles which have the potential to become bigger circles. So if natural proximity is not delivering the desired uh, pro uh, sort of closeness or uh, growth in uh, economic ties, I think interdependencies have to be called in to uh, create those opportunities which will set an example for this. So, I mean, sometimes I would say that, okay, uh, bilateral trade may be growing between different countries, but if you create, ultimately create a network of bi bilateral trade and, you know, uh, bring them across a larger frame, uh, you will have a regional trade. Richard, the building on this point of uh, <laughs> creating the supply chains, essentially this is an example of supply chain. And Samir also referred to the fact that we have been focused on the ground and not the water. Do you see that investing where, you know, all the countries together can create projects which link the waterways in the Bay of Bengal area, the roadways. Uh, also, you know, perhaps India, Bangladesh can be the link to Southeast Asia. What are the kind of suggestions you have on developing new ideas which will enable trade and investment? <clears throat> See, the uh, I agree. The If you look at the logistics cost in this region, it's one of the highest, highest. in the world. Yes. And because of inefficiencies, which we, and you spoke about the inefficiencies because of the way we are structured today. I mean, I'm giving you a small thing. I heard um, in uh, Nepal, they grow potatoes. It comes to India for washing and it goes back. I'm just giving you a very small, very <laughs> trivial example. But if somebody puts up a washery in Nepal, I mean, I'm just saying you can just wash it there only and, and do it. But uh, taking that point away, even forget about linking with even India to link to India. If you use from uh, Bengal, West Bengal into Northeast, Bangladesh is the route to go, waterways. So at the, if there is more cooperation in this region, and I think uh, this region, including India, has never used or utilized waterways in a big way. And that actually brings down logistics costs very much. If you look at all the inland waterways Europe has created, that has brought it down considerably. And is I think there that scope is, for public-private investment and, and partnership? Yes, on there this? is a big scope for it. And also the other point I want to put out here is there are nine highways being conceptualized in Asia. Nine highways, out of which six run through South Asia. South Asia. So I think if these somebody can take, say, okay, take some of these highways and create it, I mean, of course, there'll have to be funding. Who's going to uh, who's going to get the economic benefit and everything else? Because it's going to be disproportionate. So one will have to see how to do it, and that's when this PPP thing will actually kick in, and then say, how do you actually make it work? But PPP, in the real sense, uh, has to work in a model which is workable on all sides. And uh, and this will be more perhaps complex, but you know, important because one, it may require other countries to so work. So one together. more example I like to give. I think Samir, you raised the point on uh, digital. Right. I think let's not lose that because the whole globe is moving towards digitization. Bangladesh has got one of the best internet, telephony, um, uh, 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 this thing uh, there. India has got very good software. India has got very strong on telecom. If both these come together, internet is the way to go. Where telephone is going to get, I mean telecom is going to get onto the internet. I think if collaboration can come in all these areas because like I said, each of these countries have their unique skills. Market sizes are different, but unique skills are there. If you can bring these skills, the IT powerhouse, the accounting powerhouse, the textiles, <clears throat> and we combine the waterways which you spoke about, if we combine it, we can create a huge market out into Southeast Asia, which we have ignored this part of the world. I think we need to move, and I think this South Asia can actually become the, <clears throat> the, the cooperation on this could be much better. Secondly, also, you know, we spoke about trade. I think global trade is almost dying. If your globalization is now taking a different tone, some, something new is going to emerge. What is that? We don't know. But in my view, it's going to be more prosperous than what we have. It'll, there'll be some pain before that. Well, there will be, the market is. There really. will be some pain, yeah. but there will be ultimate uh, succession, and it'll come from small trade block, <coughs> trading bo blocks getting created. Between uh, Minister, uh, you yeah, if I may add to what you're saying about uh, particularly trade in goods among our uh, countries, one of the biggest problems is the non-tariff barriers. Mm -hmm. There are so many non-tariff measures. I think we all have to find some mechanism where we can yeah. uh, remove these obstacles. Uh, at the same time, we have to work on mutual recognition agreements where standards among these countries. There should be like common standards for the common region. standards. Correct. So that I think will yeah. create a lot more 
uh, it'll open a lot more but that was my original question to you also minister who is going to build these common standards well who, between uh, whose whose table does the document lie on yeah actually you know india being the biggest india. country <laughs> india i think uh, they have to take the lead in they fact we have been discussing with india on this issue <laughs> right and uh, we are getting some positive uh, uh, response so india has to lead the way right samir no you know i want to jump in here on the word interdependency and i think the biggest interdependency hurtling towards us or or is now that is being that is emerging is around uh, the whole issue of um, climate change and sustainable development and um, you know we keep talking about movement of goods and services are we talking about <coughs> movement of people and i think we need to start belling the cat in many ways are we when we talk about regional economic integration there is an implicit element that allows movement of people as well that's you look at the european economic community and mm. and, and and other asian uh, asean uh, grouping so well, the african union has launched <coughs> a africa passport that's right so so i think so one so i think one uh, indian proposition to the group which may create an attraction for a sub regional grouping could be around um, uh, visa regimes and so that's that's again a non tariff barrier but yeah. visa regimes is a big hindrance to there is to, a sub visa which is uh, for businesses for business. but Uh, so so that's what for provisions the second is and i think this is extremely important the largest chunk of our populations are still in that bay of bengal community engaged in fishing and and they live off the oceans and the blue economy and i think that's again one new area where uh, where we must start working to act together on creating sustainable coastal infrastructure and ensuring that uh, the fishermen and the and the coastal communities um become partners and stakeholders in this effort to integrate and i think we have a uh, huge potential there and the final point i think is that we must understand three sets of new rules for the 21st century are currently being written first the norms for the digital world how you will conduct trade how you will price data how you will store it how you will keep it safe how you will encrypt it etc etc do we want to be passive recipients of what emerges from other parts of the world or should there now be a south asian proposition on this is the way we should be managing data and with 2 million or sorry 2 2 and a half billion um, uh, strong um, uh, community i think in, uh, we should be taking the lead that's one second new rules that are being written is around uh, develop the whole development paradigm now um, we have all signed on signed on to a common un deal uh, last year in september are the south asians talking about it right and the third and final point that we need to understand is that eventually bay of bengal community is going to be uh, the indian ocean is going to be uh, witness to three or four big powers so are we creating norms for the ocean norms that will allow uh, safety and security of trade line trade links of, of sea links and i think we need to start to go, uh, start talking about the intersection of security with trade and again it, it boils down to the essential issue that you know framing of these ground rules and the structures they have not happened yet and perhaps that's why all the countries need to really rapidly come together under one roof <coughs> discuss one single framework and say all the rules will be written under that and i think that's the need of the all let me bring in some thoughts and questions from uh, all our uh, other participants here if you could uh, introduce yourself and keep it uh, short and brief so that we can take in lots of ideas sure uh i'll come to, can we have the mic let me collect a couple of thoughts and then uh, come to uh, one here and one here good morning yeah go ahead please good morning uh, i'm kitwana hevage i'm a global shaper from colombo uh one of the actors an important actor in regional cooperation and integration in south asia is ironically china mm -hmm. uh, particularly with the one belt one root framework so i would like to know from particularly from policy perspective as well as an investment perspective how does this non regional entities uh participation in regional activities uh influence that and is a possibility of an bimstek trade agreement within a, a possible rcep the future of uh regional integration in south asia that's a lot of questions and will need a long answer <laughs> but uh, good questions So I think China does think of itself as South Asian also but that's another story. Thank you very much. Um my name is uh, Hamid Nuru and I'm with the World Food Program country director in India. So I'm sure everybody expects me to say you know where has food featured in this you know and why am I here because this has to do with trade but I will not therefore ask the question I wanted to ask 
I'll do a one-on-one -on -one with the Cargill representative, Mr. Sarag. <laughs> but just to make one or two comments from the, from the general presentations. The first thing is sure. there's a lot of lessons that need to be learned. And I agree that you know, looking at how you can revive blocks rather than looking at the whole is very important. Africa has gone through this, and I am from Africa, Botswana. The regional economic communities like SADAC, ECOWAS, all the other, you know, this is exactly what they did. And I think lessons can be learned from there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel on that. Uh, the comment on cricket, I understood, but uh, I say Africa, of course, is football rather than cricket. So where does food really come into this? This particular region now, we have a lot more of these middle-income countries which are now you know, springing up. And really, the role of food and food security is primary. Before you can even go into trade or health or education, you know, you have midday meals in schools. People go just so they can get education. So this is really a, a, a primary thing, considering that more than 50% of the hungriest in the world are within this region alone. And yet this region is now is an economic powerhouse for the future. This is something that needs to really be addressed. And I'll take it offline with those of you who I will, I will speak who later on. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. I think uh, food security is so critical for the region. Uh, one mic here, please. My name is Minnie van der Poel. I'm a partner with Baker & McKenzie and I'm the Global Chair of Compliance and Investigations Group. And one of the things that we haven't heard today is about risk. Um, with every opportunity, there is also risk. And in this region, one of the biggest issues that companies face is, uh, you know, the risk of uh, corruption, um, uh, unfair competition and those types of compliance issues. And unfortunately, that crosses uh, all the geographies that we have uh, at the front of the room. So my question is, are you going to also consider a common standard and approach whereby you will actually take these risks <coughs> seriously um, and create an enforcement environment where companies understand what the rules of the game are? Because, you know, just like cricket, this is a, this is a common issue that, uh, that is shared. Thank you. Um, so maybe what we'll do is uh, that we'll probably end after this round of answers. I'll, I'll begin with Richard and come down the uh, uh, panel and request everybody to react to these issues. Richard, would you like to begin? <clears throat> so maybe I'll take the risk one. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, we didn't cover it uh, because basically we were trying to see how to get the cooperation going and you know, every time you put something down on a paper, you'll say yes, but we cannot do it because of this. Uh, and. Uh, but I think the risk issues are real, and it's just not for the region. I think it's across the globe, uh, the risk issues. In fact, we had recently done a, a survey of the CEOs, and the biggest risk that uh, the CEO saw for India was the geopolitical risk, as in the top three risks. And uh, cybersecurity is another one. Uh, the point which you talk about corruption is another area. But um, uh, just from an India perspective, I can give you an answer and say that a lot of that has improved considerably. There has been uh, strong moves in that direction. So when the government gets serious and wants to move into that direction, I think things can happen. And uh, we have seen the, uh, it moving in a very positive way. And there are a lot of global companies who operate in India who uh, uh, can, are able to manage in the system and not get, uh, though you keep hearing stray cases here and there whenever they happen, and recently we had one. But but I think this, this is being dealt with. I think people have, I think the first thing we have to understand is any growing economy, it's the pangs of a growing economy. All Western economies, when they grew, when if you go back into the history, I think it's replete with a similar kind of situations, what they've also gone through. So it's pangs of a growing economy, prosperity, not getting to everybody at the same level, and that's why some of these things actually manifest themselves. Uh, but as the as the prosperity grows, I think this will slowly get more mature and it will it'll get dealt with. That's my personal view on this. Because I do a, work, a lot of work on this governance and other side, and I can tell you it's improved considerably. Thank you. So uh, actually, uh, you know, one of the very commonly used word in these discussions typically is the non-tariff barriers. And a lot of that comprises of uh, what you talked about. And I think uh, getting those barriers down is really about, a lot of it is human element there. Do you, do you want to also talk about food security, yes. even though he didn't ask you the question? <laughs> no, I, he's, uh, he's been wise to stay off that because that can be a long discussion. <laughs> but yes, I mean, I think that's critical. And, uh, you know, and, and I've been thinking about it from a perspective of India setting this goal of doubling the farmer's income by 2022. And that obviously entails uh, significantly improving productivity. And uh, we had this discussion yesterday under the same uh, forum. Uh, now, if all this food was to be produced, uh, where will it go? 
And so how do we place uh, this growth in agriculture that we are looking for uh, into the region? And that would entail then bringing down the barriers. I think one of the, I mean, the point is very clear. This is also the region with the highest incidence of poverty and uh, food security. They have, uh, there have been good examples of how it has been addressed. So sharing of best practices is one thing which is very easy to begin with. Uh, it's not just about food security. It's also nutrition security, which uh, uh, there are great examples in different countries uh, that are being. Another thing which has come up, and I think India has taken the lead in that, uh, which can be shared across the region, is the whole concept of food safety, which is quite closely linked to nutrition security. So I think there is a lot of work to be done. Uh, but to begin with, I think the starting point has to be more clearer and uh, closer information sharing. I think the awareness about what is needed, where, what can be produced, where, I think that common information needs to come on to a page and then better decision making can uh, happen uh, with the region as the perspective rather than uh, local areas. Thank you. Uh, Minister Kamal. Also on the fact about, is, is China part of South Asia yet or not? So the question is, <laughs> <laughs> the question is, uh, you have not taken it in a, in, the, in a spirit. We expected that you should take it. That is a one belt policy. So again, I'm saying one belt was there in the past. If you go back to the history, then you'll see that that was there. So everybody is trying to, trying to come back or revisit the old things so that everybody can be benefited. Now, after the demise of demise of Lehman Brothers on 15 September 2008, after that, what we have seen, it is almost a decade. Mm -hmm. In every part of the world, most of the parts of the world, either there is recession or there is deflation. So, and then a subdued scenario is still, I mean, so in that, uh, on that basis, we have to think, we have to revise our, revisit our own position also. We have to combine ourselves, we have to integrate ourselves. That is, there is no denying to this fact. So if we do that, in that case, we will have a lot of answers, very easy answers or um, acceptable to everybody. You see, Benjamin Franklin, in 1783, he made one observation. The observation was that he was making, he was saying, I'm feeling sorry to say like that. I've come onto this world a little early. I've not seen the discoveries. I've not seen the wisdom. I've not seen enough of education. What will be coming next? So it is true, during, uh, he, from now, about uh, 233, 233 years back, he was onto this earth. And during that time, there was no economy. During his time, the size of the global economy only was $82 billion. Versus now, it is $78,000 billion. Imagine. During his time, he has no tap water. He has neither any telephone, nor any electricity, nor any motorbike or, motor, or any motor car. <coughs> nothing like that. So, now we are better off compared to, compared to that position. And uh, it does not take a long time. Again, I'm saying, you see, right. if you go back to the history, you'll find in 1991, the per capita income of the whole world was only $1,000. Now it is eight times bigger. It is $8,000. And the poverty level also, about 100 years back, it was 95%, it was 90% plus was the Poverty level. Now it, it has come down to level of 12 percent. So everywhere improvement is there. What the world could not give us 200,000 years, right. we got everything during the 50 years. Life expectancy has gone up more than double. You know, it was less than 33 years. Now it has gone 76 so, so plus. You're saying the pace of change is rapid, and therefore yes. South Asia can benefit. So from it is. It is. It is. I'm. I'm sure you will have to take everything into proper perspective, and then you will have the answers. And you will see, it is the time we'll have to integrate ourselves more intensely so that we can sustain our development, we can keep up the pace of development, and we can move forward together. We should move forward together. I'm saying again, we should move forward together. That is the only solution, you know, because right. South Asia, I mean, not South Asia, Asia, by the year 2030 will be 
half of the world population will be living in this area and almost almost 30 percent of the middle income people will be here and working age population will be more than more than half of the total world you know so in that case this is a big region big area we'll have to think that way and we'll have to think big and we'll have to materialize those things correct for the benefit of our Young for the benefit of our future generation and for the benefit of our people. Thank you. Minister Samar. Yes, if I uh, take the question of China first, I don't sure. think that any country in the world can afford to uh, ignore China. And uh, in Sri Lanka, we are certainly uh, working very closely with China to improve our economy, to develop our country. But we are not doing that at the expense of any other country. Yes. So that is the most important thing, and we are we are well aware of the security. But can RCEP and uh, SARC or BIMSTEC all work together? Do you see do you see possibilities there? Well, I think most of the countries in the region, uh, for sure, even Bangladesh included, I think will need some, to work with China to develop the country in some way or the other. It doesn't mean that you can completely isolate them, but it doesn't mean that you should also. We must be aware of the risks. We must be aware of the security concerns that countries like India will have. But once you address them, I think there is a lot of positive development that can take place. Now, for instance, we are uh, discussing a free trade agreement with uh, with China. So, if we if we conclude, we hope to do that by March next year. Uh, manufacturers, entrepreneurs can set up their plants, their industries in Sri Lanka, even from India, and make use of that free trade agreement to export their goods to to China. So there are so many advantages that you can you can have. When you look take the issue of corruption, in Sri Lanka we are taking that issue very seriously. A new government has been placed for about over a year now. And uh, we have done a lot of uh, we have made a lot of progress in that regard. And we have minimized corruption. I don't think it's possible to eliminate in total, but there'll be some level of corruption controlled. but it's being controlled and as far as the government is concerned we are very open and transparent in all our dealings so we have addressed that very seriously and uh, the third issue i think food security, food security. Food security is certainly a uh, concern because the world is growing and uh, in sri lanka we are self sufficient in rice and because of the restriction of land now we have to look at ways and means of improving productivity in the other areas, in agricultural products as well, uh, in, in particular. So we have to use technology to see how we can improve productivity and be more efficient in producing goods. Thank you. I'll take one minute from you, sir. You see, we have discussed almost every point. Only one point, it has come to my mind, you know, because I should share with you. The futuristic outlook in the economic arena. It is, we have talked about digitization, we have talked about automation and all these things. Now, this particular area, the way you, it is coming up, I don't know how you will address this issue. Because already, driverless taxis are in, in the, on the roads in Singapore. Agriculture, in agriculture there will be no human being will be available. All will be taken over by the machines. So we, are, we, will, we will be producing the machines. That particular machines will replace me. That's coming up. So you see, that is another idea. You'll have to think of right from now. What Benjamin Franklin, he could not see. Most of the discoveries. I am also now apprehensive. The discoveries what are coming up, coming up in a big way. And I think it's time to make plans, that's a, that's how, to, how to adapt to, the, to those circumstances. And I think that's one more important point on the agenda that South Asian countries have to talk to each other on, which has so far not been on the agenda. Samir, you probably have the last word. Good. So on food security, I think the point is right. We have to move from uh, obsession with volumes to nutrition and uh, regional, uh, and sorry, rural supply chains and infrastructure for better distribution. I think that's, no one is going to die because of volumes. They, will, they, are, they are suffering because of lack of nutrition. 
Second, uh, on um, compliance and, and corruption, um, I think I agree again with the, the panelists. It's um, growing pangs. If you want investment, if you want global investors to be interested in, in um, entering your geography, you will have to start meeting best standards globally. And it's uh, it will be useful if uh, under any new arrangement that we come up, we are propositional in putting forward uh, those um, benchmarks. And finally, on... Um, on OBOR, I think you uh, we must recognize China is already in South Asia. Uh, the question is, um, how do you want China as an actor in South Asia? No one is denying and no one is trying to say that we don't want Chinese investments or Chinese businesses in trade. I think the question here is, do we want to engage with them in a manner which is beneficial to all, or do we want to be in an exploitative relationship? What is clearly visible even in South Asian region, I won't take the name of the country, the country is aware of it, is that curiously, as their engagement with China rose, they are again uh, in, in the midst of an IMF restructuring plan. So uh, it has been witnessed in many locations all over the world, not only in South Asia, that Chinese business and IMF restructuring go hand in hand. So you have to start thinking about sovereign debts and is that the kind of relationship. Now, if we work together as a region, I think we can try to uh, uh, get the dragon to behave well. And I think that is why as a, our proposition should be on how to manage that uh, that new uh, that new actor in this region. Uh, on and, and like I said, you know, finally, uh, we are living in a world which has three generations living together. The first will retire at 60 and will have to find meaning for 25 years of life they will require to be uh, employed or gainfully occupied. We are living, we also have a second generation, which is around my age, who will never have the luxury of retiring. We'll have to keep working to survive. And finally, we have the generation behind me who will never have formal employment, as we know it. And we have to find uh, human value for all of them. And that is why I was saying, Think about human value chains. Think about informality on the digital platforms. Think about um, uh, uh, you know activities that will make um, all these teeming millions that we have here not a bane, but in fact gainfully productive. Thank you, Samir. And I think the the only sentence I can use to sum it up is that we have to stop talking only bilaterally. We have to start talking in a multilateral fashion, and that will ensure that the multilateral interdependence is going to be far more beneficial than just bilateral dependence, which could perhaps not always turn out to be what it is. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank all of you for being here, and I'd like you to join me in thanking the panelists for sharing their views. Thank you.